Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Beach Grove. This morning we have a special treat. Uh, the kids are going to lead us in worship first before we get everything else going this morning. So I hear there is no telling what we're about to see or experience. So um, so it's going to be a joy no matter what. So let's, let's uh, welcome the kids this morning.
Good morning, Beach Grove. I'm just going to start from down here, if that's okay with everybody. I'll make my way up there when I can. Um, first of all, I just want to praise the Lord uh, for you guys being here. Welcome to Beach Grove. This is your first time. Would love for you guys to fill out a green card right in front of you, put in the offering plate. We'd love to have a record of your visit and be able to make contact with you. I um, also want to praise the Lord for our deacon's work day yesterday. Hopefully you saw some great progress made outside. Thank you. We had a pretty good turnout and got a lot of work done in a, in a good amount of time. And so very thankful for that. I want to put a couple things in front of you before we get started this morning. Number one, uh, this Wednesday is our Easter Resurrection Trail. Really excited about this. There's going to be a story trail um, telling the story of uh, Jesus and the crucifixion and the resurrection. There's going to be candy. There's going to be a craft. There's going to be dinner. It's this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Because of the event, we're not going to have prayer meeting. But if you do come to prayer meeting, I want to invite you still to come. Um, mingle with the families, get to know people. There's going to be a lot of people that normally aren't here coming this Wednesday. So come and meet people and get to know people and um, you know just show them the love of Christ. It's this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Um, okay, then tonight, really big event tonight, our outreach to the community is at 4 o'clock. I know it's super uncomfortable. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking around knocking on doors. But I just want to challenge you to step out in faith and participate in this event with us. Our goal, we have a really big goal of 200 homes today. Okay, that's what we want to do. We're going to be going to Mimosa Estate. So if you... If you're, I live there. If you live there as well, we're going to be going to your neighborhood. Um, so if you're in that neighborhood, you, you might as well come because we're going to be knocking on your door. Um, but, but the goal is, okay, we're just going to be knocking on doors. We're going to ask, hey, how can we pray for you? And we're going to give them a gift, a little bag that has an invitation in it to Easter, everything going on this, this next couple weeks. Um, it's going to have a gospel track in it. And so really we're just saying, how can we pray for you? We want to invite you to church, not a confrontational sort of thing. And then, you know, hopefully there's an opportunity to pray for them right there. Maybe you get to the gospel, but the gospel's in that bag you're giving them, And that's all we're going to do. And so if we, if we have a good turnout, the, and actually what I'll promise you is, is your group will have 10 homes. Okay, so what I'm asking you to do is come, knock on 10 doors, and then you're done. Good to leave. Okay, so it's four to five, but we'll meet here at the church. We'll pray, hand out bags. You go knock on 10 doors. You're done for the night. Okay, we all do that together. 200 homes, all within a mile of this church. Um, that's pretty awesome. So it's a, it's a small ask in a way, but we're asking God to do big things for his kingdom. And we'll pray about that later. So I want to challenge you to be here at four o'clock for that outreach. Super important and um, I pray that God will use it in a big way. Also, just want to put in front of you that our Good Friday service is 6 p.m. up in the sanctuary. It's going to be a shorter service, no child care or anything. We're going to be having the Lord's Supper. We're going to be doing some, some worship, a little bitty uh, message, and, and it's going to be a great time. So I want to encourage you to come out on Good Friday um, and celebrate with us and, and remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Besides that, we're going to turn to one thir uh, Psalm 136. Verses 1 through 3. If you'll stand with me for God's word as we enter into this time of worship. What I'm going to ask you to do is um, read out when it says, For his steadfast love endures forever. I want to hear your voices um, there. It will be up on the screen. So here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. Father, you are the God of gods and the Lord of lords. We come into your presence together because your steadfast love endures forever. God, we want to praise your name this morning. In the name of Jesus, we come to lift your name high. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, again. Uh, this morning we are going to, as we do every week, lift high the name of Jesus because He is worthy. Amen? He is worthy. He has done it. He has gone before us. He has walked among us. And He has died and risen again. So it is, He is worthy of our praises, worthy of our worship. Um, so let's, let's sing together.
Amen. You guys can be seated as we come to God's word. I want to read Deuteronomy, starting in chapter 5, verse 6. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor. Let's go to God now. And Father, as we read this, as we read your Ten Commandments, Lord, we um, are pricked in our conscience and our heart, knowing that we have fallen short of your glory that's displayed here in your word. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you can convict us of our sin and draw us to repentance and to righteousness that we can live in a way that honors you God I pray um, for those who read this list of commandments God and and we know that we're sinners we recognize it we see it we see we've fallen short God will you bring comfort and assurance of your salvation of the power of Jesus blood but God, we also pray for those who hear this list read with a hard heart in this room this morning. And God, we pray that through the power and um, just the strictness and the, the clarity of your law, that you will, Holy Spirit, convict of righteousness, judgment, sin. God, we pray um, that as we study sin this morning, that you will open our eyes to see it for how truly disgusting it is. God, we, we do turn now to, to pray for our outreach tonight, Lord. We pray for a good turnout from our people. God, we pray that this doesn't impact on us, that we can love our community, that you can give us a gospel urgency. God, that you will give us passion for people, that you can give us love for people, love for your word and love for your kingdom. And God, so I pray, first of all, that, that our people respond to this call. And God, I pray that you can, you can get a good group here. And then as we go out, Lord, I pray that we're received. I pray for just providential encounters. Um, I pray that we come at just the right moment with just the right words. God, I pray that we can pray over people. I pray for the materials we'll, we're giving them, that people will read them and consider them. I pray for every single gospel track that's going to be given, Lord, that you can use it beyond any of our imaginations and that we will see people from this community come and check things out on Resurrection Sunday. And I pray that you can lead them to be born again, Lord. Now we pray for our Bible drillers um, this afternoon as they're going, Lord, that you can keep them um, clear-minded, that you can give them peace, 
clarity of recall, and we pray that they honor and glorify you in that, Lord. Um, we pray for our mission trip going to die, or a lot of them are leaving today. Lord, we pray for safe travels. We pray for safety on the, the, the mission field in Dyer. We pray for uh, wonderful encounters where they can share the gospel. And we pray for the work to be done, a unified team. We pray for you to be glorified through that group and give them energy and strength and love. And, and God, we, we pray that it, you use that trip to, to build them up as well. Finally, God, we do pray for our Easter services, um, for Good Friday, for Resurrection Sunday morning, for our um, event on Wednesday. Lord, we just ask for gospel fruit. We just want to honor you and glorify you, point to the hope of the resurrection. And God, I pray that you can use all these efforts for your kingdom. So God, we come before you now wanting to worship you through giving. We, we be honored by what we do here in our sacrificial giving, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. If our men can come forward at this time. Would you stand with us? We're gonna sing to our rock, our cornerstone. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy raven side which flowed be a sin the double cure cleanse me from his guilt and power not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy thoughts
today we just we bring nothing um, but gratitude nothing but thankfulness because you have done it all and we praise you we give you all the glory pray this in your name amen amen Amen. you may be seated if you're a bg kid you can be dismissed this moment if you have your bibles if you can take them and turn them to genesis chapter 3 as we're taking a quick break from our series in Mark. Start a quick little mini-series called This Is Our Story. In one sense, we're going to be studying the story of our world, the story of everything. In another sense, we're going to be studying the history of every personal Christian. We're going to be talking about your story, our story as Christians, as believers. And so this is a four-part series. Today we're talking about our problem as we'll be studying and discussing the doctrine of sin. On Friday we're going to be talking about our substitute as we meditate on the cross of Jesus Christ. On Sunday we're going to be, next Sunday, um, Resurrection Sunday, Easter morning, we're going to be um, preaching on our resurrection, talking about our hope and rejoicing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the next Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, we're going to do a message called Our Hope studying and preaching on the doctrine of heaven. So, really excited about it. encourage you to come, especially come out on Friday, um, obviously Easter morning, um, but excited to study this series. This is our story. But today we start with our problem. I want to ask, why would we take a whole Sunday to talk about sin? Why talk about our problem? Number one, this explains our world. Something is wrong with our world. And the biblical worldview, specifically the doctrine of sin, is the only convincing explanation of what's going on here. Every other worldview can't really figure out why things happen like what happened this week in Nashville. But the doctrine of sin does explain why. It explains the world. Number two, it explains our condition. The first step in solving a problem is correctly identifying the problem. And often we as human beings can misidentify our problems and label our problem as low self-esteem or lack of education or deny that a problem exists altogether. But if we properly identify our biggest problem, that helps us live in wisdom. So for the Christians in this room, if we have a proper doctrine of sin, that helps us live wisely and live in a way that glorifies God. And finally, the doctrine of sin explains our gospel. The good news does not seem so good until you fully understand the bad news. It really doesn't. So when we sing things like, you know, He's rescued us from... And He's freed us from sin forevermore. If you don't understand the doctrine of sin, that doesn't seem like that good of news. But if you truly understand what that means, He's rescued us from sin forevermore. If you have a true doctrine of sin, it just makes the gospel seem so much more beautiful. The more clearly you know, and not only know, but I hope you walk away this morning feeling the doctrine of sin. Feeling how wicked it is, the more beautiful the gospel will seem. So we have two points this morning. Our past, that's what we're going to to search through in Genesis 3, which leads to our problem, which is the doctrine of sin. So our past and our problem, our past, we'll see it in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read all of it, but I'm going to to break it up into chunks. We're going to talk about it like that. So let's pray right here at the front, and then we'll, we'll dive into God's Word. God, thank you for your Word. God, I pray... Um, for discipleship in this moment, 
that we can grow in our knowledge, but also, God, grow in our affection, that we will love you and hate sin more. God, I pray for those who are far from you, hardened hearts in this room. God, I pray that you can melt the ice um, through your word, God, and you can reveal to them the condition that they're in apart from you, Jesus. And in your name I pray. Amen. Genesis 3, let's um, read verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. First, the serpent, who is Satan himself, Notice the serpent is crafty, wise, cunning, sneaky. But notice the serpent is made by God. Okay, so this isn't like a God's rival. This is a creation of God, the serpent. I know you might have questions about that, but we don't have time for it today. But the, the, he asked the question to the woman in verse 1. Did God actually say? We see Satan casting doubt on God's word. The first thing he says in the Bible did God actually say? Now in context, we know that's not what God said. He said, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Okay, but if we look at chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, God doesn't say that. He said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God generously gives every tree of the garden to eat, but withheld one tree from them and merely said, don't eat of that tree. And then in the command, he gave a warning that if you do eat of that tree, you shall surely die. So Satan makes his accusation. Did God actually say you should not eat of any tree of the garden? And then Eve, in response, um, does a poor job summarizing God's word. Do you notice this? In verses 2 through 3, where she says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. So here we see Eve add to God's word. God never said not to touch the tree. He said simply not to eat it. But So what Eve does here, she makes God's word more strict than it actually was. And then we see in verse 4, the serpent comes out and just directly and defiantly denies God's word and says in verse 4, you will not surely die. Genesis 2, 17, God says, you shall surely die. Satan in um, 3, 7 says, um, 3, 4 says, you will not surely die. Simple denial of God's word. But there's an accusation here in verse 5. That he doesn't just say it's not true, but Satan makes the accusation that God is lying to Adam and Eve to prevent good from them. Do you see that in verse 5? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So last week um, when Zach preached, we saw our God's a good heavenly father who's generous and gives good gifts. But Satan makes the accusation that God's not generous. He's actually keeping something good from you. So if you break his command, you'll receive this good that he's trying to prevent you having. So after the denial, Eve's perspective changes on the situation about the fruit in verse 6. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. It was desired to make one wise, and so she took it. This threefold um, temptation we see in um, Eve here reflects what we see in 1 John 2.16, which says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So right here, this threefold temptation right here. So, um, yeah, it's right there on the screen. The desires of the flesh, you know, we see in verse 6 that she sees the tree was good for food. And then it says the desires of the eyes, and we see it was a delight to the eyes in verse 6. And then finally it says desire to make one wise. And then in 1 John it says um, the pride of life. 
That right there is the, the nature of sin. That's what, that was the temptation she was facing in this moment. And so what she does is she takes it, she eats it, she gives some to her husband, who is with her. I want you to notice that. That the entire time this temptation is going down, Adam was with Eve. Right there with her, watching all this happen. In Genesis 2.15, we see that God gave Adam a command to work the garden and keep the garden. Another way to say that is to guard the garden. But Adam didn't guard the garden. He failed in this task. He let the enemy sneak in, was passive towards the dangerous temptation, and tragically hurled the entire human race into sin. And here in these six verses, I believe that we see a picture of Satan's playbook that is still used today, where it goes from doubt to distortion to denial to disobedience. Let's look at this real quick. First, we see doubting God's word. The first thing Satan says in the Bible is, did God actually say? Satan cast doubt on God's word. He made the woman question what God really said. And this temptation comes to us today in this room in the form of doubting the inspiration of Scripture. Is this really from God? Or doubting the inerrancy of Scripture. Is this really true? It comes to the temptation to question whether the Bible is really God's Word and whether it can be trusted. And this leads to distorting God's Word. You know, Eve got God's Word wrong. What led to this? We're not sure. It could have been because the command was given to Adam. So it could have been Adam's failure to disciple and pass on God's Word to his wife. Or it could be from the deceitfulness of Satan's temptation. But God never said she couldn't touch the tree. But God's word here was distorted to make it more strict than it actually was. To make God look more strict than he actually was. Undermining his generosity and love for Adam and Eve. And this temptation comes to us today through false teachers twisting God's word. Or from an individual's ignorance of scripture leading them to get God's word wrong. This happens. There's a doubt in God's Word. There's a distortion of God's Word. And this leads to Satan just straight up denying God's Word. God said you would die. You surely won't. Not only does Satan deny God's Word, calling God a liar, but he attacks the character and generosity of God in this passage. He says God is lying to you to prevent you from something good. So this happens all the time today in just a pure straight assertion that God's word is a lie but even more even more common is that God is lying to you to prevent you from something good this is very popular in our culture today where God's word is seen as oppressive I think um, the biggest example here is that you know biblical sexuality the culture would say oppresses you and limits your enjoyment in life preventing you from being all that you are. That's the lie that Satan says today. But in reality, biblical sexuality is really God's best for you. And that leads to human flourishing. All this leads to you know, the doubt, the distortion, the denial leads to disobedience. That's what happens in verse 6. Direct disobedience to God's command. This happens over and over again today in our world, in our culture, in our own hearts. Let's look at what happens in response in verses 7 through 13. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So as Satan predicted, Satan said, Eat the apple, I mean, eat the fruit, sorry, and your eyes will be opened. And their eyes truly were opened in verse 7. But this was a twisted truth. This was a half truth, and that's what Satan offers you. Their eyes were opened, but not to wisdom, not to glory, not to beauty, but their eyes were opened, and they were filled with shame. They realized they were naked, they were exposed. 
And this feeling led them to hide from the presence of God. In contrast just to the, to the perfect fellowship they experienced just 24 hours before. Could you imagine that? Perfect fellowship with God with no sin in the way. Nothing standing in between you and God and your, your, your wife and your husband. I mean, everything's perfect in this world. 24 hours later, you're hiding from God. Your eyes are opened. They were naked. They were shameful. And they were hiding. They were fearful. And God asked three questions. Where are you? Who told you? And have you eaten? And this leads to Adam immediately playing the blame game. And we see this in verse 13. I mean, sorry, in verse 12. I mean, just imagine in in chapter 2, verse 23, Adam says, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I mean, this, there was such an intimacy, this beautiful first marriage that God brought together and he was rejoicing in Eve. And then just moments later, one chapter later, sin has laid him basically to say, this is her fault, kill her. That's what sin has done here. Hey, here she is, kill her. It's her fault. This was your idea, God, and her fault. Now we see Eve here is a little more open. The fourth rush, she said, the serpent deceived, deceived me and I ate. Now comes God's response in verses 14 through 19. Then God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That verse right there, verse 15, don't have time to cover it. This is the proto-evangelium. Some will say the first gospel. This is the first prediction that Jesus will come and crush Satan himself. We go on to verse 16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So first we see God curse Satan and promise his defeat. Then he speaks to the woman about how sin will affect her, specifically in the areas of childbearing and her relationship to her husband. And then finally, speaks to Adam about how sin will affect him, specifically in the areas of work, being cursed, and the futility of life. And then finally, we'll we'll end the story here in verses 20 through 24. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. There we see the first sacrifice, animal sacrifice, to cover man in his sin and his shame. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden... He placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So man gets driven out of the garden due to his sin, driven out from the paradise that God had originally created and guarded the way so that Adam could never return, so that we could never return. Sin had entered Adam's heart and thus had entered the world and paradise had been lost for all of us. If you've lived any amount of time in this world, on this planet, you feel that's true today. Paradise has been lost. We are alienated from God's purposes for us. Ultimately, this is our story. Genesis 3 is our story. And it shows us our problem. So let's examine our problem this morning. First of all, I want to talk to you about the doctrine of original sin. As we saw in Genesis, man was made without sin. There was no sin involved in Adam and Eve. But through the choices they made, they fell into sin. And ever since then, 
every single boy and girl is born with a sinful heart. Adam and Eve started off without sin. They were made without sin. But ever since then, because of falling into sin that Adam did, everyone after is born with a sinful heart. We see this in Romans chapter 5. We see it in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Then we see in verses 18 through 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Do you see that? One man's disobedience leads to all of us being counted as sinful. We see it in Psalm 51, verse 4. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So as a baby, before being able to make any sinful choices, we already had a heart and mind twisted towards sin. Through Adam, sin entered the world for all mankind. Think about it like Adam um, represented all humanity. And Adam's sin as our representative plunged all of the human race into sin. It's kind of like a football team, and if one person jumps offside, the entire team gets penalized. Does that make sense? And so in Adam, he sinned, he transgressed God's law, and then all of us, because of what Adam did, has been counted as sinful. We're all a part of this fallen human race. This shows us that we are not sinners because we sin as much as we sin because we're sinners. It's who we are in our core. We are born into a sinful condition. And sin defines our existence. That's who we are. We're born that way. And that's why I want to say that argument, that excuse, I, I'm, I was born this way, isn't a very good argument. Do you see that? As a justification for choices. Because the Bible teaches we're all born as broken sinners. Desperate for God's grace and forgiveness. Desperate in need of repentance. So it doesn't make much sense to say, well, I was born this way. So I, I, can, I can commit these sins. I can go on with these things. So I was born with these desires. No, the Bible teaches that we're born broken people in need of restoration. I know this can rub people the wrong way. You might doubt the doctrine of original sin. You might see a cute baby and think there's no way that cute baby is a sinner. But if you ask anybody who currently has a cute baby, you might say, okay, I, I kind of see the point, Matt. Um, or I might just feel wrong to you. One, one proof of the argument that I want to point out is to, just to show you that we are, are all born into sin is the fact that we are all sinners. Have you noticed that? There's like a 100% sin rate in the human race. There's not one single exception here. I mean, every single person has sinned. We see it in Romans 3, verses 9 through 12. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Without exception, we are all sinners in this room. Without exception, we are all sinners in this world. It is our state. It is our condition. It is something we are all born into. Now, as an aside, I want to point out that at, at salvation, we do get a new nature. That's a completely different sermon we can't talk about today, but that's called being born again or regeneration. But even then, in that moment, if you are a Christian this morning, we still have that old sinful nature. It doesn't depart from us at salvation. It's what Paul calls the flesh. And it still resides within us. And, it, and we still have to fight against it every day as Christians. Okay, so we're born sinners. And that leads us to committing actual sins. In other words, we are all born sinful in Adam. But give us the chance and we'll do some sinning ourselves. Does that make sense? It doesn't take long for our original sin to become actual sin. Hope you, make, hope you understand that distinction I'm making. So, I want to ask the question this morning, what is sin? What is sin? We're talking about sin, we've, we confess sin, we're, we're born into sin. I want to define sin biblically. 
Sin is anything we say, think, or do that breaks God's law. Or anything we don't say, think, or do that God's law commands. Does that make sense? So there's a distinction here uh, between sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are sins that we commit, and sins of omission are good things that we don't do. Both those things are sin. So it's a sin to say, think, or do anything that God says not to say, think, or do. But it's also a sin to not say, think, or do everything that God says to say, think, or do. So, for instance, it's a sin to lie. That would be a sin of commission. But it's also a sin not to be encouraging. That would be a sin of omission. It's a sin to gossip. That would be a sin of commission. But it's also a sin not to pray. That would be a sin of omission. It's a sin to murder. That would be a sin of commission. But it's also a sin not to love. That would be a sin of omission. And at its core, as we saw in Genesis chapter 3, Sin is rebellion against God's law that's found in God's word. And that's what we see in 1 John 3, 4. And a very simple statement here. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is going against God's law. And since God's law reflects God's heart, sin is against God himself. Every single sin of commission and omission is against our good, gracious creator. What is sin? You could also say that sin is missing the mark. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not missing the mark as like an accident, like you're trying your best but miss, but intentionally aiming at the wrong goal. Sin leads to a degraded life that is alienated from the purposes and presence and glory of God. Think of Adam and Eve. They thought their sin... Their rebellion against God's law was going to lead to glory. It was going to lead them to being like God. But actually their sin led to their shame. It led to a degraded life. It led to alienation from the presence presence and purpose of God. Did it not? We could say that sin is evil. The opposite of all God is. 1 John 1.5 says, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. But in sin, there is no light and only darkness. In sin, there is pure evil leading to separation from a relationship with God. I think of Psalm 5-4 that says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. So think of Adam and Eve. After their sin, they went from a relationship with God in God's presence, walking with God in the cool of the day. But after their sin, they, they had to hide from God. Their gracious and loving creator. They were alienated from him because sin is evil. It's the opposite of God. Finally, sin is hating God. Have you considered that? That sin is hatred towards God? Notice that's what, um, it stood out to me when we read the Ten Commandments. Um, God, uh, Moses makes this, it's like either you hate me and don't listen to me or you love me and obey my commandments those are the two things so sin is hatred towards god psalm 2 2 through 3 this is the heart of sin the kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the lord that's what sin is and against his anointed saying let's burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us it reminds me of this quote of thomas watson where he says sin would not only unthrone god but ungod him That's what sin is. It wants to un-God God. It wants to cast the cords off. It wants to burst God. It wants to set itself against God. So the question this morning is, do you see the wickedness of sin? That it's rebelling against God's law. It's refusing God's gracious word. It's living a life apart from God's wisdom. It is missing the mark of God's beautiful intention in your life. It's spitting in God's face and rejecting Him as your God. Sin is anti-God. Sin is hatred towards your Creator. That's why Romans 1.30, there's this one small verse in there that says, it describes us as haters of God. That's what sin is. And I want to say this description of sin describes 
all sin. As Joel Beakey says, the smallest motion of sin in your heart is a criminal act of hostility to God. The smallest motion of sin in your heart. Do you see your sin like this? I'm certain you probably see big sins like this, right? Or maybe even other people's sins as criminal acts of hostility to God. But do you see your small sins in this light? Sins like laziness, lack of prayer, bitterness in your heart, inappropriate joking. Do you see those acts as crim a criminal act of hostility to God? As missing the mark, as evil, as hating God Himself, as wanting to ungod God? Oh, Christian, people in this room, if only we could see the disgusting, horrific, evil nature of even the smallest sin. Notice that sin is anything we say, think, or do. So we're talking about thoughts in our mind and just thinking. Hebrews 4.13, where it says, No creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In Genesis 3, we see a picture of Adam and Eve trying to cover themselves up, realizing they're naked and exposed before God. But that was, those fig leaves were just a sham because they were just as exposed as they were before they hid. And we are just as exposed in this moment as they were. God sees us every single part. He knows the intention of our hearts. And we're going to have to stand before this God and give an account for our sins. So we have to ask the question, what are the consequences? God made it clear in Genesis 2.17 that the consequence of sin is death. And it might seem in Genesis chapter 3 that Satan was right. Because as you know in the story, Adam did not die in Genesis 3, did he? That couldn't be farther from the truth. Sin brings death in three different ways that I want to highlight this morning. Number one, sin leads to spiritual death. James 1.15 says, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. At the moment Adam chose sin, he was separated from God. They were no longer in blessed communion. But he had become alienated from his creator. And the same thing is true for us. Isaiah 59 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin separates us from the God of life and leads to spiritual death. That's why this is how, listen how Ephesians 2 describes us apart from Christ. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You hear that? Dead. In your sins. Following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature. Here we are by nature. Children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind. There's that doctrine of original sin. By nature we are sinful and children of wrath. Like everybody else. So in sin. Apart from Christ, you are spiritually dead. There's no life apart from Christ. Yes, you may walk around, you may eat lunch, you may laugh and love, but you're dead to God in your sins. That's the consequence of sin, the smallest one. Number two, sin leads to physical death. Adam, no, he did not die immediately after his sin, but he did die because of his sin. Did you know that? Genesis 5.5. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. I know 930 years seems like a long time, but it wasn't as long as it was supposed to be. Adam was not made to face death, but God's warning came true. And not just for Adam, but go read Genesis chapter 5 and see over and over again, and he died, and he died, and he died eight times in that chapter. The consequence of sin is physical death. In our culture, we have a false view of death. 
said all the time, something like death is natural. The most natural thing that can ever happen is death. Did you know that's not biblical? The Bible teaches that physical death exists in this world because of sin. And if it was not for sin, Adam would have never died. Death was not originally a part of creation. Let's look in God's Word. Romans 5.12, we've already read it. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. You see that? Death entered the world through sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Every single death in the history of mankind is a testimony to the consequences of sin. And think about all the deaths in history. Over and over again, it's showing us the wickedness and the horrific nature of sin. We see it in every death. That's why it says in Hebrews 9.27, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. You are appointed to die due to your sinful nature and your sinful acts, and you will be judged by God. Which leads us to our third Consequence of sin. Eternal death. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. God is pouring out wrath on all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The terrifying thing is that sin does not just lead to spiritual death. Sin does not just lead to physical death, but it leads to eternal death. Sin leads to hell. Revelation 20. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Listen, if you physically die while you're spiritually dead, then Jesus will say to you what He says in Matthew 25, 41. Depart from Me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It needs to be emphasized that this horrific punishment is eternal. As it says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might. God's wrath will be poured out forever and ever and ever upon the sinners who have not found redemption in the blood of Christ. In the doctrine of hell, as somber as it is, it's helpful to us because it allows us to see the true horrific nature of sin. In the doctrine of hell, we see sin for what it truly is. That it will be punished for all eternity. And it deserves to be punished for all eternity. Because that's how disgusting sin is. It leads to eternal death. One author, J.I. Packer, says, New Testament teaching about hell is meant to appeal to us and strike us dumb with horror, assuring us that as heaven will be better than we could ever dream, so hell will be worse than we can conceive. So our problem, to sum it up this morning, is that in our nature and in our choices, we are incredibly sinful, completely unable to save ourselves from an eternity in hell. That is our problem. For everyone in this room, I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes this morning to see sin as God sees sin. First, I want to pray for the Christian. You know, this biblical doctrine of sin changes the way we should live our day-to-day life. Where we can't take sin lightly anymore. We can't make excuses for sin. We can't bat it off. But we need to really realize how terrible and horrific it is. And it reminds me of this poem I read this week from John Bunyan. Sin is the living worm, the lasting fire. Hell seen would lose its heat could sin expire. Better sinless in hell than to be where heaven is and to be found a sinner there. One sinless with infernals might do well 
but sin would make of heaven a very hell. Look to thyself then, keep it out of the door, lest it get in and never leave thee more. Fools make a mock of sin, will not believe. It carries such a dagger in its sleeve. How can it be, say they, that such a thing so full of sweetness e'er should wear a sting? They know not that it is the very spell of sin to make them laugh themselves to hell. Look to thyself then, deal with sin no more, lest he who saves against thee shuts the door. What I want to say to the Christian is is to, to realize the danger and just the disgusting nature of sin and repent of it and forsake it and, and don't flirt with it and don't live with it and don't, don't accept it in your life anymore, but repent and, and flee to the cross of Jesus Christ. And then finally, once you have the biblical doctrine of sin, I hope you feel, at least I feel, the heaviness in the room dwelling on these topics. Once you feel that heaviness, then what happens next weekend is so much more sweet. Once you know that our problem is sin, but Jesus went to the cross to solve our problem, that yes, we deserve an eternity in hell, but Jesus went to the cross to take that punishment for us in our place, that He was our substitute. And then once you realize that not only did He die on the cross, but three days later He rose again to life, and He's reigning and ruling and victorious over sin and death, and He's able to save you and free you from this. You see, you have to feel the weight of sin, you have to feel the darkness of hell, and then you see the glorious light of the gospel. But until you see what you deserved, the, the forgiveness you received doesn't seem that good. But you have to see the darkness of your situation. And then realize the hope you have of indestructible eternal life with Christ. Now, if you're a Christian in this room, that's good news. If you're not, I want to encourage you, if the Holy Spirit's revealing sin in your heart, if you're feeling the weight of sin and, and fit, almost feel like you can't breathe or anything like that, I want to encourage you to, to go in the back when we sing this song. Pastor Chad's back there. Paul will be back there to talk. And just go to them. and they, they, know, they know what you're going through. They can help you out. Okay. So if you have any questions, don't wait until Easter Sunday okay, to feel resurrection power. Okay. Today is the day of salvation. Okay, but if you're a Christian, I, just, I, I pray that you just got a glimpse of what you've been saved from. And that can cause you to rejoice and praise God and be filled with joy. This whole week, Easter Sunday should be an explosion of celebration because we deserved an eternity in hell due to our sin. But we're not going to get that thanks to the blood, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that not good news? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. God, we confess that we're sinners. Oh, God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you can impress upon us that weight. And then, God, for those who have fled to Christ, God, I pray that we'll realize that it's been nailed to the cross. We praise you for it, Jesus. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your substitution and your resurrection. Thank you for the hope that we have. God, I pray as we talk about this is our story, God, that this will be all of our stories. God, if there's anybody in here who feels the weight of their sin, God, I pray that you'll, you'll lead them to have a conversation before they leave this campus today and that you'll give them spiritual life, give them repentance, give them faith in you, Jesus, that they will um, experience your forgiveness and your joy. God, I, as we look into um, sin, I pray that we can linger on it and, and not leave it too fast, and I pray that it can cause us to have explosive joy in the gospel as we respond in song. In your name, Jesus, amen. You guys can stand and sing. If you have any questions, go back there in the back right now to slip out.
Before we go, just got two two things to say. Um, before we go, want to remind you of our outreach. So please be here at four o'clock. Um, be praying for that as well for fruit. Also, want to point out we have a ton of these up here. We we printed these out. These are invitations to our church. They look really good. They're nice in quality. What I want to encourage you to do is. Um, uh, including tonight's outreach, for you to take a couple of these. Um, there's some up here, and I'll take a whole stack um, in front of me and just hand, put them out here on this table here. Take a couple, give them to personal friends, family members, invite them to come on Sunday. Um, there's also a little place you can write on it yourself. Um, so please take some of these, invite some people to church next week. I'd love to see them. Let me just read this blessing over you guys. Um, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's respond to that in song and then we'll be dismissed. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him.